So ladies and gentlemen, let me welcome uh, uh, Brian Binney with us, and so we'll learn more about being an astronaut today. Thank you. Um, welcome. Uh, it's my great pleasure to be here. Uh, I have spent the last hour and a half um, at 890 Oval Circle, about 45 miles away from here, and realizing the error, racing back, just arrived. Uh, Ken, thankfully, has it all set up. And uh, um, yeah, the talk is uh, not computer science orientated. Uh, I have one slide. I can't help but notice, um, it harkens back to my uh, student days, everybody's hunkered at the, right at the exit door for a uh, <laughs> quick departure, and I, I, I totally get it. But, um, uh, and thank you uh, for the introduction. So here are the four uh, spaceships that uh, are privately funded, uh, have been worked on, some have um, you know, sort of been set aside, but uh, um, I've had the pleasure to have uh, participated and flown all of them. And they all have one thing in common, uh, which um, I'll just tell you up front because you'll, you'll not uh, really get it. Uh, uh, being small startup companies using private money, not government money, uh, they all have a dreaded fear of a thing called turbo boost pumps. And uh, my only real educational lesson for you in uh, rocketry is that uh, if you want to go to space, you got to bring your own oxygen with you, basically, right? So you have an oxidizer, usually it's liquid oxygen, then you have a fuel, uh, kerosene, hydrogen, whatever, um, that are then mixed together in a combustion chamber, produces thrust, and off you go. Uh, most designs uh, like to keep the propellants in low pressure tanks uh, because they're easier to build, they're lighter, um, less complicated, and uh, they use these turbo boost pumps uh, to bring the propellants up to pressure for the combustion chamber to provide sufficient thrust to deliver the power necessary to, to get going up. And those turbo boost pumps are uh, point designs, they're very complicated, they're difficult, they're very demanding from an engineering standpoint, uh, you know, how, how to build them, and uh, their life-long uh, uh, use is typically limited. They tend to spin at some phenomenal rates uh, greater than 35,000 RPM. So if your turbo boost pump has a bad day, it tends to take out anything in its near vicinity along with it. So all of these companies said, eh, we, can't, we don't have the time, the money, or the interest to go down that path. We'll uh, take a different approach. And so that's kind of the common theme uh, beyond that. Um, guys like me that uh, always uh, had an interest in aviation, uh, not necessarily um, being a... Uh, an astronaut, uh, but I knew what I wanted to be when I was growing up. I, in that regard, I'm kind of fortunate. This is a painting my uh, parents gave me shortly after Neil Armstrong's uh, famous uh, milestone, One Small Step for Man, One Giant Leap for Mankind, back in 1969. Still hangs up in my uh, office wall uh, at home uh, today, and has sort of been an inspiration uh, throughout uh, my uh, career. And now I'm going to tell you everything I know about uh, computer science for the few, uh, a few in that arena. And it uh, goes like this. In the early 80s, something like this or close to it was delivered to every squadron uh, within the Navy. We didn't know what was coming. We didn't know what it was. We didn't know what to do with it. But it was a Zenith Heathcote uh, computer uh, Heathkit, I don't think, uh, is around anymore. Zenith, maybe, but not in the computer business. Um, you know, had a DOS operating system, floppy disk. Came with Lotus 123, uh, precursor to Excel. 
and then the uh, sort of exclamation point, 32 kilobits, uh, not megabits or gigabits or whatever, kilobits of memory. And for the life of me, um, I, I ended up sort of adopting this machine. And that, you know, every month they require you to fill out various forms and send them off to headquarters, that kind of thing. And I thought, well, at least could computerize that process. And I could not. Uh, I always got three chords away through it, and I was told, you're out of memory. You're done. And so that thing just became a paperweight in somebody's desk. Um, so back to uh, space. My, my real first introduction to uh, aviation was at Princeton uh, with this aircraft. I'll talk a little bit about it. I uh, left the, uh, the world of academics to join the Navy, spent 20 years there. The most exciting flying, I think, still uh, any young man or woman uh, can have. Uh, left the Navy to join Rotary Rocket, talk about that. Left uh, that company to join another one, uh, flew this airplane called Proteus uh, nearly around the world, um, both poles, um, Australia, uh, many adventures. Spaceship One, uh, uh, certainly talk about that, Spaceship Two. And these days uh, I'm with uh, another company called X-Core Aerospace uh, building this vehicle, the Lynx. And uh, I tell you all these things not to uh, fluff up my uh, uh, background uh, by any stretch, but to simply put it in perspective, I hope. Uh, the most terrifying thing I've ever had to do professionally is really not to uh, monkey around with these vehicles, but to sit down and talk <laughs> with this gentleman. And uh, just note uh, who is part of the lineup uh, given today's politics. So it was a lot of fun. Uh, Dave was very kind to me. He can be quite, uh, you know, he knows how to turn the screws if he wants to, um, but I certainly wouldn't want to do it for a living. So this business of space, uh, what's all the, the fuss about? Well, I'm, my, my message is it's uh, the freaking 21st century. You can go mountain climbing, skydiving, scuba diving, uh, climb the Himalayas. And if you want to uh, go to space, um, you ought to. You ought to be able to do that. Um, how hard can it be? Because uh, I'm here to tell you it's an experience that will wrap itself around you and it won't let go. That's a photo I took uh, from Spaceship One. Um, uh, it's just a delightful place to be. And uh, since you're a college-looking audience, for the most part, uh, there may be a couple of exceptions, uh, uh, what are your motivations, uh, regardless of what line of endeavor you're in? And I, I bring this up because I, I suffered uh, from all of these symptoms uh, uh, going through uh, my career. Uh, staying comfortable, and a lot of them are kind of redundant. Uh, being fearful, shying away from new experiences, uh, get out of college and you kind of stop learning, giving up uh, too easily when faced with challenges, uh, risk avoidance, excuses, uh, instant gratification, kind of having a narrow view of the future vice, a longer one, <clears throat> being a spectator vice a participant, uh, being the critic vice the person in the arena 
sweating it out, doing the hard work. And the last and perhaps most important and difficult one is if uh, you want to succeed, and I think uh, everybody does at some level, you have to be willing to fail. And there's always two sides to the coin. And that, uh, that's <coughs> um, just is the way life is. So uh, given that you are uh, a prestigious university, uh, again, in whatever endeavor uh, interests you, uh, sort of uh, elevating the standards in that uh, industry is, should be a motivation. This picture could have been taken when I was a, a young uh, lad growing up in Scotland. Uh, I was in seventh grade. We had a competition, a uh, sports competition, and one of them was uh, the high jump. And I remember clearing a bar at four foot three, uh, doing this kind of, we used to call it the scissor kick. Well, between those days and today, thousands of people have looked at that same bar and one person looked at it differently and says, I've got a better way of getting over that. And his name is Dick Fosbury, right? And so now nobody goes over the bar like this anymore. They go over it like that. And uh, anyone know what the uh, high jump uh, uh, record is currently? I'm, I'm not quite six feet, but if I stand here and put my, my hand out, I could not reach the bar. So it's, uh, it's over eight feet. Uh, pretty remarkable how a uh, shift in perspective uh, can, can really prove uh, to be rather dramatic in terms of uh, performance. <coughs> and talking about uh, shifting perspectives, so even in the 70s, which is when I was uh, in graduate school, we thought we knew everything pretty much there is to know about um, general aviation aircraft, but you put on these funny looking uh, wings growing out of the wings and you can control what we call direct side force. Now there's not an airplane out there today that I'm aware of that utilizes this. Um, maybe it's just not that practical, but uh, this airplane had some tremendous capabilities. It was fly by wire, analog, not digital. We had a sister aircraft that did not have uh, these devices on it and uh, we would do air to air combat, air to ground maneuvering. Uh, instrument approaches, all that kind of stuff. And this airplane would beat the pants off uh, the other one uh, in spades. And again, it was another one of these sort of eye-opening um, experiences for me. Left, uh, left that world to join the Navy. And, uh, this picture was taken uh, shortly after the Desert Storm was winding down. At what point uh, there were now four aircraft carriers in the northern part of the Persian Gulf, uh, you know, providing uh, support for that effort. And you would think most of the uh, action and anxiety was over the beach dealing with uh, Saddam's hardware. But I'm here to tell you in the daytime, when you come back uh, from doing whatever you're doing, uh, feet wet, uh, all these guys are under what we call MCOM con <coughs> conditions, emission control. They're not talking to you on the radio, so they're not uh, 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 radiating, radiating any navigational uh, direction beacons. There's no data links. And you're up at 35,000 feet. Uh, you're always low on fuel, and you're, you're looking around. And these guys have no contract with you that says, okay, in two hours, I'm going to be here. In four hours, I'm going to be there. In six hours, I'm going to be here because your time uh, aloft could uh, be, be changed quite a bit. So you're literally just kind of poking around. And it's always hazy out in the Gulf. Uh, you finally f find a carrier. And there's a sigh of relief. But then the very next uh, concern or thought is, I wonder if it's mine. Because from uh, six miles up, they all look the same. And <clears throat> I'm here to tell you, if you land on a different carrier from the ship you took off from, your career just uh, took an interesting turn. <laughs> <laughs> so I left uh, the Navy to join this company, which uh, wasn't short on uh, small dreams. They said, boy, if we could build a rocket that came back like a helicopter instead of an airplane, 
where wings and tails and landing gear, which had nothing to do with getting stuff up in space, aren't necessary, uh, we could maybe get ahead of the curve. And it was all written about uh, in this book here, still available uh, at Amazon and those kind of places if you're interested. And uh, so their way around this turbo boost pump uh, phenomena or concern was to have a big rotating disk uh, of engines uh, shown here. There were 70 plus of these things uh, on the circumference, uh, all spinning around on a wheel supported by massive uh, bearings. So the propellants would come down through a central shaft. Somehow you get this thing going and the um, fuel and oxidizers would be uh, fed out uh, to the respective engines. And in the process, the centrifugal uh, force uh, would uh, increase the propellant pressure sufficiently to provide um, thrust. And so we built the engine. We did some static test testing, but never on a rotating test stand. The recovery system um, had suffered sort of the same uh, effects. We thought, we hoped initially there would be enough inertia in the blades that uh, um, it would be sufficient to land the vehicle. Well, we found that wasn't true, so we uh, sort of um, went through the same mental process as well. We can add a little rocket at the end of the tip, uh, the blades, plumb the blades for propellant, in this case hydrogen peroxide, and we'll store it all up here. So when we're in the landing phase and the blades are deployed, we fire up the hydrogen peroxide and we got tip rockets uh, uh, giving you about 10, 15 seconds worth of hovering time uh, before touchdown. We did some ground testing. And there are some interesting uh, features when you go down that path. And <clears throat> there's probably not too many helicopter pilots in the room, but maintaining rotor RPM is paramount to just about any helicopter, and it's under automatic control. Well, this was not under automatic control, it's under manual control. And <clears throat> it is not uncommon for there to be, say, a five RPM uh, dither in the rotor RPM, just because you're pulling, collective, changing the lift of uh, the blades and all that. So um, with tip rockets uh, powering the uh, the blade systems, however, that 5 RPM error, um, as it says in the box, uh, in 3 to 4 seconds will become 10 RPM, 6 to 8 seconds will be 20, and shortly thereafter it's at 40, and you failed something structurally in the rotor system, and if it's on the uh, decreasing side, soon you will have uh, stalled the blades and uh, you'll fall out of the sky. Uh, so you were within 10 seconds of, uh, you know, some sort of a catastrophe uh, with this system. And what was true for the rotor system was also, oh, by the way, going to be true for the, the main engine had it ever been built. I don't know if the, they teach you root, root locus anymore, uh, but um, uh, we use it a lot. But the, the basically this vehicle, if you got it airborne, it, it had, had a tendency to wobble around, as you, as you might imagine. And Fixing this wobble was kind of important to, to get it back on the ground. And it was uh, hugely uh, dependent on what you did in the cockpit, depending on your relationship to the, to the wobble. So if you're wobbling like this and you're pointing this way, you fix it doing something left and right with the cyclic. But if in the process you wander 90 degrees off, you're still wobbling like this, but now the fix isn't left or right, it's fore and aft. And so in the cockpit, you had to do the cosine of the angle between you and the wobble. And, um, <clears throat> and if you were in forward flight, it just wanted to pitch over. And um, so it was terrible. But we did fly it, uh, flew it three times, five takeoff and landings. Here's a little bit of how it looked. <clears throat> a 
I kind of like uh, this uh, photo uh, for a couple of reasons. Uh, one, there's snow in Mojave. It, you know, it's happened maybe t twice in the 19 years that I've, uh, I've uh, worked there. Uh, but the yellow sign that says, <coughs> should say stop ahead. Um, I always look at this picture um, with the snow covering up uh, uh, the initial parts of the letters. I always read it as drop dead, <laughs> which <coughs> was certainly going to be the result had we kept flying that vehicle. It, uh, it now sort of stands as a uh, sentinel at a place we call uh, Legacy Park in uh, Mojave that pays tribute to the people that have uh, lost their lives in this uh, line of work. Spaceship One, I, I, I just like this picture. Um, the, their approach to this uh, dreaded fear of turbo boost pumps was, well, uh, be damned uh, with uh, lightweight tanks. We'll just build a tank that's beefy enough, robust enough to withstand the pressures required to support combustion right from the get-go. And <clears throat> it's hard to do with uh, LOX or liquid oxygen. Uh, but there's another uh, substance or oxidizer out there called nitrous oxide, N2O. And it's a, a very um, interesting fluid. It's, um, it's a little bit like carbon dioxide. If you shake it up, it's got a lot of vapor pressure. Um, it's like CO2 on steroids. And so uh, if you fill the tank and, and it tends to uh, be cold when you fill it, because that's how it's uh, shipped and delivered, but you warm it up to say 70 degrees, which is kind of where the pilots are comfortable, then it will self-pressurize uh, that uh, tank uh, to the necessary pressure, well, about 800 PSI, sufficient to support uh, uh, combustion. So you open a, a valve and you let this high pressure oxidizer flow through a combustion chamber. In our case, it was this uh, rubber-like substance and you ignite it off and you got thrust and off you go. Spaceship uh, two, um, <coughs> on the heels of the success of Spaceship One, uh, maintained the same uh, uh, concept design. Big tank, uh, you know, Spaceship One tank was yay big around. Spaceship Two tank is again, you know, I, I can stand inside of, inside of it, not uh, touch the, uh, the top. And so uh, the engineering case for building uh, that um, container, much more difficult. And uh, uh, many of the uh, delays of that program have been uh, the result of uh, trying to scale up this uh, propulsion uh, concept. But here's the rollout uh, we had, I uh, can't remember when, uh, 2009. Uh, but just a good-looking spaceship, uh, great-looking mothership, uh, aerodynamically um, all very solid. They've had some setbacks uh, that are well advertised if you care to go um, uh, looking for them. Here's the cockpit uh, for Spaceship Two, um, very sophisticated, uh, supports uh, two pilots, two air crew, home-built uh, avionics. Uh, so. Um, whatever comes up on the display is what the pilots have said, hey, this is what I want to see uh, type of thing. Uh, here it is uh, in flight doing a, a glide flight. And then um, finally, uh, Exegor Aerospace, the, the vehicle, this is called the Lynx. Their approach to the same dreaded turbo boost pump uh, effort is to say, well, there are other pumps out there. And for suborbital flights where we're not going to go, uh, necessarily, you know, around the earth and all that uh, kind of stuff. Uh, a simple piston pump can be put to work uh, to do the job for you. And by piston pump, I mean if you look at a motorcycle uh, three-stroke engine and you pull that off and maybe make some adjustments to the bearings uh, inside of it and, and other modifications, that's what this uses. And uh, that's really what attracted me to the company because I really felt it was now an approach that um, was simple, well understood, uh, easily maintained. Uh, the parts, you could buy them from uh, just about anywhere. The industry standard for them was uh, well understood. It has four engines, four piston pumps. So 
you can lose any number of combinations of uh, engines as long as you still have one, uh, make it back to the field. And even if you lose them all, uh, we tend to uh, develop our flight profiles so that uh, we're always in a position to, uh, with energy to glide back to the field. So uh, out of all the uh, designs, this one is, uh, has the, most, uh, the greatest potential for supporting a suborbital, say, space tourism market in my mind. It's a horizontal launch takeoff, doesn't require a mothership, it's gas and go. Um, you can refill the uh, uh, oxidizer and the kerosene uh, faster than you can get the passenger out and the new passenger in. And uh, predecessors to this aircraft have flown seven times a day at uh, various uh, demonstrations. So um, I, I find it a very appealing uh, uh, program. But I'd like to go back to Spaceship One <coughs> because there's some interesting lessons uh, learned, I think, for everybody. Uh, this is a good friend of mine, Bert Rutan. He's the maestro of uh, aviation design. He ran this company called uh, Skill Composites, retired now. Um, we were golfing buddies before I came to work for him, but uh, his MO was uh, you had to be curious about whatever line of work you're in, um, creative in trying to develop uh, solutions or looking at problems in a different way, and the courage to see it through. And <coughs> if as freshmen uh, you were told uh, to graduate, um, you need to design, build, demonstrate an, an entire manned space program in four years. And for Spaceship One, they included uh, a mothership, a spaceship, developing a rocket motor, the avionics, the simulator, the pilot training, the flight testing, and then going to space. And as we actually did it in three and a half years. But um, that was just how fast paced and uh, rapid uh, the, the building, the design, the decision making process was in this uh, little company. This is the vehicle in its uh, reentry configuration or the feather configuration as it uh, tended to be called. Uh, the wing literally broken in half. <coughs> Uh, it's a funny looking thing to begin with. The bullet shaped nose had 16 different windows. Uh, you could hardly see out of any one of them, but, um, um, and then launched from a mothership. And one of the motivations uh, for the program was uh, a pretty good carrot uh, called the X Prize, where if you did the airborne launch boost, uh, reentry landing, and you got up past 100 kilometers, which you're right, sir, it's just, uh, just past 62 miles. Um, <clears throat> if you did that twice in a two-week period, carrying 600 pounds of payload, i.e. equivalent of three passengers, then uh, you could win $10 million. <clears throat> so that was um, kind of out there, and it doesn't seem like a lot of money these days, but um, it was uh, got our attention. And another book uh, just came out. Um, three weeks on Tuesday. So it's brand new, it's number one on the Amazon uh, nonfiction uh, hit list uh, by Julian Guthrie and she's taken the effort to really sort of weave together the complex story of all the uh, comings and goings of uh, that program and uh, yours truly is uh, sort of figures heavily in uh, uh, throughout. <coughs> I'd like to try and give you a couple of quick examples of uh, the engineering thinking between the private enterprise and, and big business or government. And one example is uh, the crew hatch door for the space sh uh, shuttle when it was flying. <coughs> Excuse me. It serves two purposes. It opens to let people get in and get out. Okay, fair enough. And when you're in space, it uh, has... Uh, uh, and sufficient integrity to maintain the atmosphere within the cabin so you, you don't leak air out uh, left and right. As the sign suggests, an engineering marvel costing tens of millions of dollars. Spaceship One also had a crew hatch door, served the exact same two purposes, uh, made out of a couple of plies of uh, carbon fiber material, an orange O-ring that you can see uh, surrounding it, uh, Material costs about a couple hundred bucks and some, you know, touch labor. But uh, 
Otherwise, um, uh, you know, pretty simple. What's the difference between the two doors? Well, the shuttle door, it opens out. So if you pressurize the cabin, it now is experiencing forces on it that wants to make it move in a direction that it's designed to move. And so you then have to put in additional constraints such that that doesn't happen, which includes uh, secondary locks, overlocks, all these splines. And oh, by the way, the space shuttle commander <coughs> goes to space with a padlock and he will put a padlock on that door uh, and keep the key in his pocket just in case one of the six other crew members has some funny ideas about you know, what, what the real mission is uh, that uh, particular day. The spaceship uh, one door, <coughs> well, it resides within the cockpit. So you climb in, sit in the seat, uh, you get all buckled up and situated, and then you take this door, weighs about six pounds, and pull it over and sort of press it against the side of the um, uh, structure. You give it a little bit of uh, pressurization and it just seals itself like a cork in a bottle. No moving parts, simple, lightweight, never had a problem with it, never leaked, um, got on with life, uh, what's the next problem? Um, <clears throat> very, you know, just a different way of looking at things. If you uh, were fortunate enough to get selected to go to space uh, for the government, uh, they will insist that you wear a pressure suit for the ascent and reentry phases of flight. Um, <coughs> everybody I know uh, likes to get there. I think uh, they'd like to have a picture of themselves uh, taken with a pressure suit. But you can see, you know, it's kind of bulky, it's clunky, it uh, doesn't weigh nothing. It's, uh, it can be actually pretty heavy. Um, it's got to be form-fitted, uh, the gloves and the feet uh, to the individual as well as the helmet. And oh, by the way, on hot days, uh, you've got to carry your own luggage so you don't, uh, you know, um, dehydrate and overheat. Um, and they're expensive. Uh, they're complicated to maintain uh, the whole nine yards. And uh, just to be blunt, uh, didn't do much to help either of the air crew of the Challenger during its ascent uh, or the Columbia during its uh, reentry. Uh, a little quick on that one. It scaled. We'd say we'd rather put our money into the structure uh, than wear one of these things. We'd rather go to space in uh, shorts and flip flops uh, than be, you know, hunkered down like uh, this guy. And uh, so we built the structure of our pressure vessel to twice the industry standard. So we were um, tested to three times the sort of the hoop loads the, the cabin would experience when it's in the vacuum of space. And when you dress down <coughs> a little bit more casually than him, you can interact with future potential participants. And so there, I kind of like what's going on, on the right hand side of that screen. So uh, Spaceship One's first flight, uh, this is something most people uh, have never seen, but uh, the MO of the company was, we'll build a scale model first, see how it behaves, make some adjustments before we commit to building the big one. So we built a scaled model, took it to the top of the control tower, and here's how this one looks, and the video volume is the second one, I believe. There's Bert saying go. And that was it. And uh, I, I was a new guy at the company and uh, you know, we're all standing around watching this and I'm trying to gauge my, what my reaction should be based on everybody else's. <laughs> and um, <coughs> Bert was uh, undeterred. He liked what he saw and off we went. I got, um, so we did some glide flights and uh, I think I got the nod for the first powered flight. If for no other reason than I was used to getting my butt kicked uh, during catapult launches off aircraft carriers. When this motor lit off, it, it was like a bronco bull coming out of a pen. It was just angry and off you go. And here's a little bit of how first power flight went. It's a bit loud.
A lot of dynamics going through transonics where shock waves are forming on the vehicle. <clears throat> Not necessarily symmetrically. But you can see when you light that motor, that, that little vehicle wants to turn the corner and just go uphill like a bat out of hell. And uh, so that phase of the flight went uh, really pretty well. And uh, all, I, all we had to do was bring it back uh, to land. And I'd had the glide flight just before this, uh, a little more than a week earlier. So I was in a comfortable environment. Uh, <coughs> Those calls were gears coming. Clear land is what he's uh, seeing there. I didn't come out, uh, but that was uh, uh, the guy from the mothership who was flying sort of a high perch, just watching everything. And, and he's saying, well, that's that. Uh, it was, <laughs> this was December 17th. This was the centennial celebration of the Wright brothers' first flight at Kitty Hawk. So, we were doing our thing in the West Coast while other people were trying to replicate uh, their flight uh, nearby. And um, uh, unfortunately, that was not that. Um, uh, here's the same landing again uh, from a slightly different perspective. And you can tell right away, just from the background music, is something ominous is developing. <coughs> See this wobbling going on. <clears throat> that right gear that looks like it just uh, just about fell off uh, was never replaced. The left gear, well, it's a different story. And here's an outsider's perspective. Yeah, and that's what I was saying, except in French. <laughs> <clears throat> it was... It was a miserable way to end an otherwise... Uh, uh, an awful lot of hard work uh, to, to get to that first power flight. And um, I'm here to tell you, uh, if you haven't figured this out, uh, you can go through life and build 100 bridges, but you get a little bit of dirt on a plastic spaceship, guess what? They're not calling you Brian the bridge builder. And uh, so this is, you know, uh, Christmas holidays are coming up. I go to bed thinking about this landing, trying to go to sleep, and waking up first thing in the morning, this landing. It was going to drive me freaking crazy. <laughs> Pretty apropos. Um, maybe humorous now, but it, uh, it wasn't back then. And uh, the whole problem was with that landing was the dream, um, the hope, uh, the th thought that you could get to space was just dissolving away because the program just was under that much schedule pressure. Not long after that, I uh, was talking, uh, uh, thinking about this whole uh, innovation process and. You know, said you know, there's nothing tidy about it. it it's uh, awkward and uh, requires uh, an odd assembly of uh, perseverance, risk-taking, creativity, luck, leadership, teamwork, motivating uh, 
motivations, rewards, uh, all that stuff, blood, sweat, and tears, by the way. And um, it's chaotic. Um, it, it's not really a process that you can map out and say, okay, I'm at A, I'm going to go to B, and you know, so forth and so forth. There are problems, there are uh, all these challenges. And I was at a conference um, around that time frame, and I ran into this guy. Anyone recognize him? This is uh, Neil Armstrong, uh, the guy whose painting has been on my wall since uh, you know, I was uh, in high school. And uh, there's a saying, you never want to meet your heroes because uh, you'll only be disappointed. Well, Neil is a sweetheart of, uh, of a guy. He uh, unfortunately passed away a couple of years ago, but um, he took the time to uh, uh, talk to me. And I, I gave him this whole uh, you know, personal story of whoa, and why is it so hard to just do this simple stuff? And, What's the solution? What's, how did, what's the answer to, to this, uh, all of this? And what he said uh, really uh, um, kind of almost uh, <clears throat> made me fall over. Um, he didn't give me a technical solution. He didn't give me a leadership management uh, solution. He didn't uh, respond in any of that kind. He said, if you can't get out of bed in the morning, get to work uh, and have a sense of joy and peace and you know happiness about who you're working with, the person you're sharing a cup of coffee with or, or across the desk from. If you're not having fun, regardless of whether you're building spaceships or writing code or uh, whatever endeavor in life uh, you choose, you're probably not doing it right. You're not approaching life correctly. And so uh, what made me kind of fall over on that comment was that's what Bert Rattan would always say at company meetings. He would always open up with the same thing. Are we having fun yet? Because look where we, we, you're working, freaking Mojave, which is, you know, there's nothing going on there. So if you're not enjoying your work, um, <laughs> where, as an employee, uh, you're not going to last very long. So there was fun for pilots. <clears throat> this is uh, the mothership and Bert's private airplane uh, called a boomerang in the background. Totally asymmetric if you look at it. One wing staggered different, different lengths from the others. The tail boom's asymmetric. One day we thought we'd do a performance check between uh, the White Knight and Proteus. Briefed for about five minutes, manned up the jet. Simon Proteus, uh, Mike Malville, the other uh, spaceship pilot. And Proteus got airborne, did one lap around a pattern, three, two, one, pull up. <clears throat> and you can see uh, White Knight with uh, after burning engines got a pretty good performance uh, margin. Just nice looking airplanes. You know, with composite materials, you can make really nice, clean, swoopy lines. Uh, the saxophone, I think, just. You know, that does some justice. And of course, the engineers weren't going to be left out. Uh, one enterprising guy says, well, if you're going to put hybrid motors on a rocket ship, I'm going to put it on my bicycle. So uh, this is uh, how we spent our lunch times, uh, this kind of stuff. So he says, OK, here I come. Never a good idea to be looking 180 out from where you intend to go. He's lucky it actually didn't go off. We'll give him a second chance. <laughs> anyway, uh, pretty aggressive little thing. He, he started breaking uh, uh, almost as soon as he started going. And then finally, uh, final slide, and then I'm done, is uh, perhaps, <coughs> maybe, fun for you. And um, the motivation for the next video comes from a wonderful movie that I saw in 1968. Uh, it was Stanley Kubrick's 2001 A Space Odyssey. And it was just a year later, Neil Armstrong is on the moon uh, saluting back, saying, mission accomplished, uh, Mr. President, what's next? And everybody that grew up in that era just thought, wow, 
things are happening so fast uh, I just, you know, I'll only have to just get in line and, you know, uh, and get, uh, get an opportunity. Didn't quite play out that way, but still, uh, my homage uh, is to uh, kind of that movie, or at least the, the soundtrack uh, that's part of it. And um, here's what I think uh, the experience is uh, for you, should uh, you um, uh, want it. Of course, the one video that won't play. <laughs> Can I encourage that from the uh, desktop? Mm -mm. Uh, let's see if I can recover here with some sort of uh, degree of uh, elegance. Folder up here with all your stuff in it. Can we just go back to that and then click on the... Uh, Well, I wasn't quite as elegant as I hoped, but as exciting as the rocket motor ride is up there, by far the best part is when you shut it down. Three wonderful things happen, and I liken it to the holy trinity of spaceflight. The shaking, shuddering vibrations go away. The shrill, shrieking sounds disappear, and as so you step across the line into the instant karma of weightlessness. And then the music starts. You're in space in a spaceship. And if you're lucky enough to fly a spaceship too, the cabin is large enough, you can unbuckle the seat. You don't have to think about drifting up to the nearest window. You look up and it's as though somebody's pulled back a stage curtain for the benefit of your eyes only. There it is, the black void of the space. It's a bit of a mystery, a bit of a menace, but you can sense its majesty. And if that spooks you just a little bit, do a lazy cartwheel and look out below because there is a peaceful panorama of the likes you've never seen. From Mojave, San Francisco to the north, Baja, Mexico to the south, Pacific Ocean, Sierra Nevada mountains, weather patterns you normally only see in the evening news. And separate, separating these two improbable extremes and vistas, this thin blue electric ribbon of light, and that's the atmosphere. You're in space, in a spaceship. This is the part I like. Johann Strauss, The Blue Danube. Listen to that. Isn't that nice? So sweet, so serene, so peaceful. But I'm here to tell you, everything you feel in your body because you've worked hard to get there for lack of a more sophisticated word is wow. And everything you see with your eyes, so much more dynamic than any camera or video is wow. It's kind of cool, this is the reaction control system, so you change the attitude of the vehicle while you're in space, so I'll show it to you again. It's coming off the left wing, allows uh, a little bit of roll control. <coughs> mm. Hard to tell, but we have fine control. So you're about two minutes into a four minute experience, one that I think you'll find to be uplifting, one that'll give you goosebumps, one that'll shift your perspective on just about everything forever, leave you full of life and a joy for it. Thank you very much. <laughs>
Uh, you're still manually flying this thing. It's not a computer flying any of these vehicles. Um, and so if you remember from the video, there's a lot of uh, uh, rocking and rolling going on, uh, mostly in roll, but some in pitch as well. Um, and the suddenness of the onset uh, in Spaceship One was um, very quick. So uh, it was confusing. It was, uh, you know, the expression, the spaceship may be up here, but the pilot is about a half mile behind <laughs> holding on like that, you know, kind of deal. Um, <clears throat> it's, it's the nature of the beast. And um, uh, for all these airplanes, uh, again, they're, they're hand flown, um, so the, there aren't all these sophisticated control laws and computers and hydraulic systems, uh, you know, sort of dampening things out for you. And uh, can you hear the boom when you're sitting inside the aircraft? Like, N uh, f no, no. Um, <coughs> you hear lots of other things. <laughs> uh, I, I tell you that. Uh, but uh, the the you know uh, the the sonic boom that hits the hits the ground is uh, not something that uh, ever gets reflected into the cabin. Um, uh, spaceship one and two, uh, for that matter, uh, just due to your proximity with all the plumbing that's just right behind you, uh, right by a bulkhead, as the nitrous empties out, it goes through a phase transition. There's li mainly liquid and then it goes to gas. And in that transition, the thrust output, I didn't show you this, but it's on YouTube, uh, uh, changes by a factor of 10. So you get, say, um, uh, 10,000 pounds of thrust, then it goes down to one. And then 10,000 goes down to one as slugs of liquid uh, continues to flow through, followed by gas. And in that whole process, the vehicle, in my, to my ears, sounded like a possessed cat. You know, just <laughs> screeching, screaming, squealing, uh, which is part of the joy of shutting that motor down, right? <laughs> Everything goes, and it, and it all happens just like that. You know, it gets very quiet, and uh, it's not shaking and banging you and all that. And then you have this, you know, you're weightless. Now, you're still, you're not, you're still at 1G, you know, as far as Earth's gravity goes, but you're in a ballistic trajectory, and what, what you feel is weightlessness. <coughs> so it's a great joy. What's your golden rule for professional life and personal life? Uh, can somebody translate for me? <laughs> uh, what's your golden rule? What's your golden rule for professional life and personal life? Uh, pff, um, <coughs> don't despair. Um, uh, believe in yourself. Uh, uh, you may have a timeline for making things happen. Uh, that somebody with the big picture doesn't, you know, always uh, follow. So you you got you got to find somewhere within you um, uh, the hope and the the, the joy of just um, coming to work and and having the belief that things will play out. And you know, my my big uh, I showed you the landing, but I didn't show you. Tell, talk anything about the 10 months between that landing and that final flight. Uh, and that, those 10 months was a real you know, trial. And um, so I had you know, the painting on the wall, the inspiration. Um, always kept myself in the arena. I said, if the opportunity shows up, I'm going to be as ready as I know how to be. And uh, as things played out, uh, you know, uh, I got got the nod, and I got the got the nod that I was going to get that final flight four days before it happened. So I had <coughs> a Friday, Saturday, and Sunday before a Monday flight to kind of exercise any remaining demons uh, that you know might be lingering. So I don't know. That's a long-winded answer. Um, I, I had seen a documentary about Apollo 11, and I, uh, I saw in there that Neil Armstrong was actually selected for the mission because he had a sense of calmness even when the systems used to goof up. So like the lunar module had, <coughs> the prototype for the lunar module had 
had had been damaged uh, during one of the test flights, and yet right. he was able to bail out of that. So, uh, like, how do you manage uh, those kind of scenarios, or like in that in that uh, particular landing, like what was going through your mind? <coughs> well, the landing. Um, If, if you watch carefully, the, the airplane started doing this. And uh, we had made modifications to the flight controls uh, about a week prior uh, because somebody was concerned that uh, as we went supersonic, we were going to be prone to flutter and buzz and things would break off. And so we put in these dampeners to prevent that. What we never checked was that as during the slow climb to altitude, the working fluid in those dampeners became very cold. Um, <clears throat> so the stick became hard to maneuver, and, uh, and I could feel that. But during all the commotion of uh, powered flight, where you know, you're, you're, you're in the cockpit killing snakes is sort of the term we use, um, it was not noticed. And then in the slow spiral down to the landing, really not exercising the, the controls much at all. But as you get closer and closer to touchdown, your gains go, go up. And then <clears throat> that's when the, the dampeners started to make their presence known again. And um, uh, the, the feeling I got in the cockpit was, um, uh, I'm, I'm trying to make a small correction and, and then I get a big upset. And I feel like the airplane's uh, not under my control. Uh, that it's close to stall, but the airspeed looks about right, but I can't trust it. Or it, And all this, these thoughts are going through my head, and I thought, you know, if I'm not careful, I'm going to actually land upside down, but it's right side up. And uh, so then I'm, I'm, I'm realizing if I sort of let go of the stick, it goes away, but here comes the ground. And so I say, well, maybe there's, you know, this sweet spot, but I'll get lucky. And I almost got lucky. Uh, but the, the left gear said, not today, and uh, <laughs> off it went. <clears throat> and uh, we never flew that configuration again. Um, but, uh, but still, you know, you got egg in your face, and, um, uh, you know, it, it was, it was, it was, there, were, there were no guarantees. And it was a dicey uh, s scenario from that point on uh, for me professionally. Hey there. Um, I like the NASA hatchway example because yeah. uh, they're famous for going for like really high chances of success. Um, I was wondering uh, what kind of factor of safety they were shooting for on this and if you even wanted to know uh, the fact. Uh, the, the industry standard is uh, uh, factor of safety is 1.5. <coughs> Uh, that, that's what you generally shoot for. If, if you go for more than that, things become too heavy. Uh, weight is a killer for anything space related. We uh, had a lot of experience with pressure vessels flying Proteus and uh, the mothership to Spaceship One and had a lot of confidence and uh, felt that we could build it uh, with carbon composite materials that, you know, a very stiff, uh, high st uh, strength to weight ratio. And we could double that uh, factor of safety. And then we had a door design that didn't, you know, have the challenges of one that opens outwards would. Uh, and it was, you know, uh, effective, simple, safe, and, you know, Allowed us to move on to the next uh, next problem. Thank you, Brian. Thank you very much. <laughs>